just a minute. I'm just going to ask you to say something. Yeah, let's start with your name and spell your okay. name and okay. what, you, what you did that we're interviewing <coughs> you for here today. <laughs> I'm George Zenovich. Uh, the name is spelled G E O R G E. Last name is Z E N O V, like in Victor, I C H. I'm a uh, retired justice of the Fifth District Court of Appeals. Uh, okay. Super. And Justice Vardabedian, your turn. And I'm Steve Vardabedian. I have the pleasure today to be interviewing Justice Zinovich. That name is spelled V as in Victor, A R T A B as in boy, E D as in dog, I A N. All righty, we got it. Ready to go at any time. It is my pleasure today to be talking with retired Associate Justice George Anzinovich of the Court of Appeal, 5th Appellate District. My name is Steve Vardabedian, and I am an Associate Justice of the same court here in Fresno. As a part of the centennial of the California Courts of Appeal, the Appellate Court Legacy Project Committee is creating an oral history of our appellate courts and their justices. Good morning, George, and thank you for chatting with Hi, us this morning. Nice to be here, Steve. I would like to start with your service in the legislature and on this court, and then we will go back in time to trace your earlier years, including your education and law practice. We will then get back up to date with your activities since you left the bench, and of course, we will talk about your well-deserved honor of the naming of our new court facility, the George Enzinovich Court of Appeal Building. Thank you. You were appointed to the 5th DCA by Governor Jerry Brown and confirmed in March 1979, succeeding Justice Roy J. Gargano on what was then a four-justice single-panel district. This appointment came after you had served a distinguished career in the state legislature that started in 1963. Let's talk a bit about your work in the legislature, which included eight years in each of the state assembly and the state senate. Uh, please tell us how it is that you happened to uh, run for public office the first time when you ran for the assembly in 1962. Well, uh, what happened was my predecessor, a man by the name of Bert Delato, who was a former supervisor here in Fresno, who became the assemblyman for the 32nd district, uh, decided to take an appointment uh, to the Peace Corps from President Kennedy. And uh, he was appointed, and uh, I think this into North Africa, somewhere in North Africa, and that created uh, an opening on this in this district. So, I, several of us were involved at that time. I was I was very active in the Democratic Party and the Democratic Central Committee, and I was uh, sort of running the John F. Kennedy campaign in here in Fresno County and the Central Valley. And uh, so, uh, when this came, people said, "Well, why don't you run, George?" So I thought about it, and uh, a couple of people prevailed upon me, and I decided to run. It was a special election, and I won. And uh, that's how it all started. A big surprise to me because I never, <laughs> I thought that Delato was going to spend the rest of his life in the assembly, you know, and and uh, that there was no chance for me to do anything other than run for the city council or something. So that wasn't something that you had a long-range plan of uh, doing. No. Uh, but you did take your uh, assembly seat. Uh, and at that time, whatever, however you're comfortable. Okay. You you took your assembly seat at a time when Edmund Pat Brown was uh, governor and right. Jess Unruh led the assembly. What uh, was Sacramento like in those days? Well, it was much different uh, than it is today. Uh, of course, I hadn't been up there for a while. I, since I left to come on the court, I didn't go up there. I hadn't been up there too often. Jess was a very dynamic man, so was Pat Brown, and then the other leader in the, uh, in the legislature at that time was a man from Fresno, Senator Hugh Burns, who was the pro tem. So it, it was a, a development of, of antagonism between Burns and Brown, and then it became uh, UNRWA and Burns versus Brown. So I, <laughs> Uh, the Burns click, they had a, a television news show every Tuesday called the Jesse Huey Show, where they always gave Pat Brown a bad time. And, uh, but other than that, I mean, it was politically, it, was, it wasn't so divisive, and uh, we still got along and got a lot of things done. 
And you uh, did become uh, very quickly a part of the Democratic leadership. Right. Uh, how, how is it that you achieved such a quick rise when seniority seemed to be the rule of the day? <laughs> well, I uh, Jess helped me down here. So did Hugh Burns. Uh, and uh, when I got up there, I had that credibility. And so uh, I, uh, I fell in the line. Uh, on a natural basis with respect to leadership. Uh, I remember one of the first things that Jess asked me about was what my background was as a lawyer. And I did at that time, I was trying a lot of work on confiscation cases. So he made me the vice chairman of the Finance and Insurance Committee, uh, the Assembly Finance and Insurance Committee, and then uh, made me the chairman of the subcommittee on workman's compensation. So I got very involved there with workman's compensation and uh, it just led to things that, uh, that gave me all kinds of opportunities for leadership. And certainly you authored some very significant uh, legislation. And in fact, in looking back, what, what do you feel were some of your greatest successes in the legislature? Well, some of the things that I did in the field of workman's compensation I thought were very good, uh, but then of course have been changed since. You know, workman's comp was, uh, oh, I don't know whether that problem's ever going to be solved because it's, it's just a big money problem and benefit problem and a medical problem. And uh, it's going to be a constant, constant, constant problem as far as I'm concerned. The other things that I did uh, involved, I did some things involving uh, uh, bond issues for the county of Fresno, bond issues for the state of California. Uh, one of the most important things I thought that uh, I was involved in at the time was after, after Prop 13. For those who don't remember Prop 13, you know, that was a severe change in the financing of, uh, of, uh, of the local governments. And uh, that limitation, of 1% limitation, uh, had a tremendous effect. As a matter of fact, it moved, it took all the power, the money power away from local government and moved it to Sacramento. You know, on, on the subject of bonds, you, you are the uh, lead name author of the uh, Zinovich uh, Moscone Chacon Housing and Home Finance Act, which really is a landmark yeah. in the way uh, housing is financed in California. Right, right. It, it is a landmark, and uh, that was an interesting thing because at that time we didn't have a housing finance agency, and uh, I was very interested in wanting to do something about it, and as was uh, George Moscone, who was then the senator from. Uh, from San Francisco, and Pete Chacon, who was an assemblyman from, uh, from San Diego. And uh, we evidently did a good job, and it helped, uh, helped the economy in, 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 the, in the state. And that bond issue was very important. That was a case that came up after I left the legislature, and it came, up, came before the fifth uh, on the question of whether uh, the, that limitation, the 1 percent limitation, and the necessity for a boat uh, was required in the issuance of uh, improvement bonds. And uh, the opinion that I wrote then, which was really a rather moving opinion, in my opinion, uh, in my opinion, it, it, it kept the, the, the building industry in business because mostly everything done these days is done with the issuance of bonds in the industry. You had a lot of other areas of interest in the legislature, uh, which I'm sure you saw impact later in your career oh, yeah. as a justice. Uh, one area that I understand you had quite a bit of interest in was the uh, neurologically handicapped children. Right. Uh, the funding for the diagnostic school in 1973. That's that was right. Another, another item that you're very proud of. Right. There was a lady here in Fresno at that time who was very involved. She had two kids that were disturbed. And uh, the only way she could have them treated was to either drive to Los Angeles or drive or fly to San Francisco. So she came to me one day. This is really the purpose of, of being a legislator, you know, to draw on the needs that people desire at the local level. And she came into my office one day and told me this deplorable story and uh, why we needed one in Fresno. So I immediately introduced the bill in Sacramento and <laughs> began to move it. It took me a while. It took me about two years, two to three years, and I finally made it. So now we have this neurologically handicapped facility here in Fresno where people from the Central Valley 
can bring their handicapped children. Tell us also about some of the matters that might have been great disappointments to you in the legislature, if there were any. Well, uh, they, there was some. Uh, I can't, right off the top of my head right now, think of anything. Maybe as we go along here, I'll, I'll think of something. Uh, I served as the uh, chairman or the vice chairman of the, uh, of the Assembly Judiciary Committee and also as the vice chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and there were a lot of bills involving the courts and involving uh, the law that I was involved in and, and, and deliberated upon. Uh, I thought one of the one of the one of the real big bills that I thought uh, maybe we should have made an effort uh, to do something about was on the no fault issue, you know. Uh, but God, that was really. I remember getting letters from young Mexican attorneys saying, "Don't <coughs> vote for no fault." I've just become a member of the bar, <laughs> and I want my opportunity, <laughs> you know, to make. A good living with uh, with in the PI business, you know. I mean, very touching, you know. So, uh, in that vein, uh, the whole question uh, was sort of became moot. I understand in the area of, of automobile type liability uh, cases that you also have some background with with the guest statute. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, in fact, you proposed something in the legislature, <coughs> that, and you had some experience as an attorney. Uh, right, right. The guest that was statute. it. I got a case here in Fresno uh, some years ago uh, that involved uh, the guest statute. At that time, the guest statute, if, if you could show, if the driver of the car, uh, or if the guest could show uh, that the driver of the car was either intoxicated or driving recklessly, you could recover. Otherwise, you couldn't recover. So you had to show intoxication or, or real, real heavy negligence. And I uh, tried this case. It was referred to me by another attorney, by a prominent attorney in this town, who didn't think uh, it was worth it, you know. He said, so Zeno, why don't you go give it a try? And I did. And I got a verdict. <laughs> the jury gave me about $25,000, which was pretty good in those days. And uh, the other side, the insurance company, was really sort of ticked off. And they took it to the fifth. And the fifth took the verdict away from me. And then I took it to the Supreme Court, and the, the Supreme Court gave me back the verdict, so I had to try it again, uh, you know. But that was a very interesting thing. And then when I got in the legislature, I decided, what the heck, might as well introduce a bill to do away with the guest statute. <laughs> but that didn't work either, because the insurance lobby had a handle on, on the members of the committee at the time, you know. Well, maybe you're ahead of your time. That's uh, why it didn't quite work out that time. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. You had success with that, at least at that point. Yeah. Um, you know, many of your items of legislation obviously have impacted uh, the courts. Um, in the area of, uh, of uh, agricultural relations, uh, labor relations, I believe uh, you had a big impact. Could you tell us a little right. bit? Right. I was the principal co-author of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. And that was really uh, an interesting an interesting fight uh, because of you know trying to put everybody together, and I I succeeded in putting the growers together with uh, uh, the uh, production people and, and the uh, farm labor people and what have you, and uh, got the bill to the governor's office. I'll never forget that negotiation. Uh, we were all in the governor's office uh, putting this whole thing together. And uh, there was only one group that decided the last minute uh, to uh, oppose us, and that was uh, I, it was the lettuce industry, or a portion of the lettuce industry, I forget. Uh, their, their lobbyist at that time was named Daryl Arnold, and he, he was appointed ambassador to New Zealand or something right after this. I guess it was success in, 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 in taking the position that he did. But the Agricultural Labor Relations Act became law, and it's the first act in the country, frankly, on uh, labor relations. And I remember uh, our congressman at that time was really impressed because he was introducing bills every year back there to do something on labor relations, to set up, set up a board or a sub-board like the under the National Labor Relations Act. <laughs> and I remember he had a a bunch of congressmen out here visiting him from uh, all over the country, and, and he brought this item up 
and I'll never forget this congressman from Mississippi says, you'll never get a vote out of me, Mr. Sisk, over my dead body <laughs> for an Agricultural Labor Relations Act. And certainly that was something that was very responsive to your local uh, constituency. Right. There were other times, and maybe on the lighter side, uh, there was uh, something that came about. Uh, at one point, the Fresno County Board of Supervisors made a request of you concerning courthouse park squirrels. Uh, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, uh, that one I can't. I can't live down. I mean, the Board of Supervisors and a, and a newspaper reporter by the name of Eli Setensich, who was the courthouse reporter at that time, he's the one that called me and said, hey, Zeno, uh, you know, the drunks are killing all the squirrels in the park. <laughs> and he says, can you replace them? And I said, oh, my gosh. So I said, well, I'll see what I can do. And the Board of Supervisors also made the request. So I went to the park superintendent in the, uh, in the Capitol, and he told me, he reminded me that the squirrels up there came from Fresno. <laughs> so... So I introduced a, a, a resolution to have the squirrels, uh, to have some squirrels removed from the, the uh, Capitol Park and brought to Fresno, and we did it, flew them down here, had a big ceremony, and now we got squirrels all over the place. We sure do. In fact, I remember uh, seeing photographs of you with a hard hat and yeah. a squirrel net out there uh, yeah. getting ready to catch uh, some of those uh, guys yeah. up in Sacramento. Well, I got letters from all over the country from guys that I served uh, in World War II that I served in the Air Corps with, you know, writing me it's because of the AP picked this up. It was a big story, and there was one guy from Alabama wrote back and said, Zeno, I always thought you were a squirrel anyway. <laughs> you know, there's, there's another story about you I'd like to uh, uh, recollect a little bit about with you. Um, it was, in fact, at the time that uh, uh, then-Governor Reagan was uh, making plans to uh, build a governor's mansion away from uh, the city of Sacramento. That's, that was something that you uh, posed. And I understand that the governor left a message for the lieutenant governor uh, when, uh, when he was about to go out of uh, state. Uh, do you remember what that message to the lieutenant governor said? <laughs> well, that was addressed to Robert Prince, who was a lieutenant governor, as I recall. And the message was uh, to authorize the uh, pouring of the cement for the new for the new Capitol uh, House, or the whatever, <laughs> and to put Zinovich in the cement. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that I don't have the foundation laid with you, you yeah, in it. Was, yeah, lay the foundation idea. with Zinovich in it, you know. Um, he really had a sense of humor <laughs> on that one, and that, that started a hell of a relationship between the two of us over the years. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. In fact, a book was published in 1983 entitled Legislative governor relations in the Reagan years, five different views. Uh, you offered one of those five views. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about that view that you offered. On, well, uh, you know, I, when he first came up there, I was a little bit antagonistic because a little bit like this Schwarzenegger thing, you know. I mean, there's this actor, you know. And although I knew that Reagan was involved in some political stuff, and, and I knew uh, somewhat about his background. You know, he was a Democrat for starters, and then he changed. So it was kind of uh, kind of difficult to, to accept him, just per se, you know, because I was so used to Pat Brown and, uh, and Butch Powers, who was also another, he was a lieutenant governor, but a Republican who was an interesting guy that I was very fond of. So it took me a while to warm up to Reagan, but when I wound up, warmed up to him, uh, it was really nice. I mean, the guy has a hell of a sense, he had a hell of a sense of humor at the time. And uh, he uh, he wanted uh, to to build the uh, the governor's mansion away from the Capitol, and uh, the, one of the reasons that I opposed that was because the constant plans over the years, by the time I got there, was to include the governor's mansion just next to the uh, the Capitol, with some kind of a tunnel underneath, which I which the experts said you know would would save the save the state a lot of money. And uh, when he decided to want to build it out, I forget where in Sacramento, I took him on and he was very unhappy about it. You were described as a legislator uh, who staunchly supported the death penalty, uh, for the most part going against the grain of the position of the Democratic Party at that mm -hmm. time. 
With the exception of one occasion, uh, do you recall that occasion and how that came about? Yeah, that was when uh, the Reagan-appointed court uh, reversed uh, a case before it and said, uh, decided that the death penalty was unconstitutional. Uh, up till that time, I had always supported the death penalty, f assuming that it was constitutional. And it was a, it was a uh, written by the, the chief justice at that time. I forget his name, but he was an appointee of uh, Governor Reagan. Uh, as a matter of fact, a person who was the presiding off the presiding judge of this court, the Fifth District Court of Appeal, was considered for that job. And uh, that, that would have been Donald Wright. Yeah. Have been, uh, well, Donald Wright got the job. Right. Uh, but George Brown right. uh, was contending, and one of the reasons that they took him out of the contention was because he had a heart problem. By the way, in my opinion, he would have been a hell of a chief justice. But anyway, Wright decided that he wrote this opinion. And so at that time, George Duke Majin was a senator from uh, Long Beach, and George had always, we, we served together on the Criminal Justice Committee, and we were always killing the death penalty bills. And so, you know, George was making his big effort, and that's, that's really what got him through in the end, I think, to become governor. I mean, he was so persistent. So he immediately introduced the bill to reverse that decision and wanted me to be the principal Democratic co-author. And that's when we came to a division of opinion. Uh, you know, I, I'm very much involved in separation of the powers. And this, in, to me, is very important for this country. You know, there's got to be three different distinct parts of this whole system. Check and balance is so very important. And I just told George at the time, I said, look, George, I said, if we're going to make an effort to reverse the Supreme Court every time we dislike something it does, then this, this country's going to be finished. I said, when the, courts, when the courts no longer exist, it's all over with. I mean, legislatures come and go, uh, but the courts are fairly permanent, you know. And uh, so he, he kind of, he said, okay, he accepted it as a fact, and that was when I voted against uh, the bill for the death penalty because of my position on separation of powers, frankly. And you certainly were a strong leader among the Democrats, and while you were just that, you uh, did have a good many uh, friends among, uh, among Republicans. Right. For example, uh, retired Justice um, Gordon Cologne, also a former member of the legislature, and I understand also a law classmate of yours. Yeah. When, when he was recently interviewed for this project, he commented on how he value, valued your, your long friendship with him. Yeah. Uh, would you say you have been able to maintain these relationships more as a matter of uh, being a political centrist or based on your, your personality, or is it a little bit of both? I think it's a little bit of both, but probably more on my personality. I respect your position on whatever you want to say, and I'll defend it to the end, you know, even if I disagree. And that was it. I, I developed a, this relationship among Republicans, and they respected me for at least, you know, taking a position that they knew uh, where I was coming from, and uh, we retained our personal friendships otherwise. And so. I mean, I got all kinds of Republican friends uh, throughout the state and the country just because of that. And I think mainly because of, I never really got mad. <laughs> I mean, today, you know, when you look at the, what's going on, in, well, mostly in Washington, I mean, the, the positions have been polarized and people are screaming at each other. It's awful. It's awful. And you can't, you know, I, <laughs> I get a kick out of every time somebody addresses a congressman or a senator back there. They refer to your honor, you know, or, uh, I mean, with respect. But when, when it comes to talking to the press, I mean, they're clobbering each other. And uh, we didn't do that then. When you went, going back to that Jesse Huey show thing, I mean, uh, you know, we took our beasts out of the legislature and told the press what we thought, and that was it. You know, a, a lot of the things that you did, as, as we've already talked about, impacted the courts. But I understand there was a particular time that the legislature was contemplating splitting the third appellate district into divisions. The third district, just like the fifth, yeah. uh, has no divisions. It's, it's one 
court of a number of justices, mm -hmm. and it was then. And that was a move that was opposed by then presiding justice of that district, Justice Robert Puglia, a staunch yeah. Republican. How is it that you came to Bob Puglia's aid in that matter? Well, that's another question. When you I mean, how to, how I interacted with Republicans. I mean, the minute, the minute this man walked into my office, I knew I was going to like him. <laughs> Although I'd heard that he was really very, very, very conservative, and, and he, I guess he was, you know, but it was very interesting. Uh, uh, I had a friend who was a plaintiff's attorney there in Sacramento, and his name was Dave Ruff, I think, R-U-F-F, -F or uh, Dave Rusk, R-U-S-K, and he was very successful in getting big verdicts out of juries in Sacramento, and evidently, uh, well, the, the, they're the third, right? They, they would take it away from him all the time on some technicality. So it became rather frustrating. He used to complain to me about it. So one day he came in and he said, Hey, Zeno, will you introduce a bill to split up the, the third district court of appeal? And I said, Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, I said, This is going to be tough to do, you know. And he said, Well, let's give it a try. And I said, Well, all right, we'll give it a try. So I introduced the bill, and the first thing that happened uh, one day, I got a call from uh, Bob Puglia, who I loved, uh, I really liked the guy, and he came in with a, a former legislator, senator from San Francisco named Eddie Reagan, Senator Ed Reagan, and uh, they came and lobbied me and asked me if I would withdraw the bill. And, uh, I said, no, I, I'm not going to withdraw it. I'll just leave it there, let it die its own death. But <laughs> things have to change on the third, you know, and by gosh, they did. Now, my recollection uh, is that you were a very popular figure uh, during your service in office and that you uh, didn't very often attract uh, opposition, except there was one, one run for the Senate that I understand that you had a very close rate. Could you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, that was about a man who's uh, still around, Earl Schmidtkamp. Um, he was a big Republican then and still is. And uh, that's when Hugh Burns died, and that opened up that seat. So uh, he was very interested in wanting to succeed Hugh Burns, as were several other Republicans, you know. And um, so... Uh, the mayor of Fresno at that time was a, a man named Floyd Hyde, and he wanted uh, the job, and so he ran. But he was a rather liberal Republican for uh, Earl Schmidtkamp. Earl Schmidtkamp couldn't stand him <laughs> because he was too liberal as a Republican, that is, Floyd Hyde. So they ran in a separate primary, and, and Earl did beat him, and then I ran against Earl. And at that time, he was, uh, he was in the peach business, or he made uh, jams. And he used to walk the precincts and give everybody he talked to a jar of jam. <laughs> so you can imagine how that worked on my mind, you know, because everybody that he talked to and asked for them to support him got a jar of jam. And it was a tough fight, and I'd find either in a 55 or 56 percent Democratic district at that time, I finally wound up with 51 percent of the vote. Uh, there was a problem with the uh, elections department. They couldn't, they screwed up on tallying, and so the, the final results were delayed for about a week, and uh, I thought Earl beat me, but I finally won. So you eat that out in spite of those jars of jam that everyone had, huh? <laughs> You know, I, I also uh, have it on good authority that while you were in the Senate, uh, Governor Jerry Brown relied heavily on your recommendations when making judicial appointments yeah. here in the Valley, the Central Valley, that is. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that and the whole process of, of judicial appointments? Well, I think it's important for a member of the legislature from a given district to have some input on judicial appointments, uh, particularly if he's an attorney. Uh, because in most cases when, he is, when a, a member is, is an attorney, he, he knows uh, about a given person and he knows how that person practiced law and basically the philosophy of that person. And so I think it's important, you know, and I, I would never d make any kind of an effort to take that power away from the governor or from 
a member of the legislature. And uh, I used to make recommendations to uh, Governor Brown, and some he would appoint, and some he wouldn't. Uh, but, you know, I think that's a very important thing that to this day uh, has to be carried on. Now, if the governor is relying on somebody else in his office, uh, you know, then, then, I, then I question it, you know. Uh, but uh, I think it's important for the legislature to have, for a legislator to have some impact. So was there a point in time as you served in the legislature that you said to yourself, I think at this point I'd like uh, serving the public as a member of the judiciary? Yeah. Um, tell yeah. us how your appointment well, came about. I, I, I was very involved as the uh, uh, vice chairman of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. So I was involved in all the major legislation over those years that came out of the legislature. And uh, that sort of led me to want to have a career on the bench, if at all possible. And because, uh, you know, being a member of any given body, after all, becomes old hack. <laughs> and so I, I, I guess I was getting a little bit frustrated with the legislature, although it had changed hands several times while I was there. And so I decided to make an effort to, uh, to make, get an appointment to the fifth. And uh, I did, and I was successful. And I'm very happy that I did because I met some fantastic people here on the fifth. At that time, there was only four members, Judge uh, Brown, George Brown from Bakersfield, who was a rather conservative fellow, but a reputable fellow, decent fellow. Uh, Don Franson, a rather re a Republican with a, sort of a liberal Republican who probably, uh, had Nixon not got in trouble, who could have been on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, in my opinion, maybe the Supreme Court. Same thing for George Brown. They were both, both excellent jurists. And then there was George Hopper, the Democrat liberal, uh, who I really admired. And that was an interesting, you can imagine uh, the discussions, uh, the in-depth discussions on, on writs and things in closed session among the four of us, you know. And that was it. I think it's particularly interesting because you all had varied backgrounds, right, very right, different. Right. Uh, and you in particular, you had a background in the legislature. Right. How do you think your service in the legislature prepared you for your judicial duties and this interplay you had with these three other justices? I, I think, uh, I frankly, now that it's all over with, I think it's very important for a member of the court here to have been, had some experience as a legislator. Uh, I know when, when we get into a crunch, uh, they'd always get on my case and say, well, Zeno, you know, what did you people up there in Sacramento mean when you wrote this? <laughs> and I said, well, if I knew something about it, you know, I'd, I'd give them my, my feeling about what the intent was, what was the intention. Uh, but otherwise, I'd have to check, check the record, you know. So, so I they, think had, they had instant legislative history right here. To that's right. Feedback. That's right. That's, that's right. And I think, it, I think that's very good. Uh, frankly, I, I'd like to see more members of the legislature eventually appointed to the court, particularly uh, to the Court of Appeal. Now, uh, you didn't have any trial experience because you went directly from the well, I, yeah, legislature. I had some trial experience. Uh, I mean, as a trial judge, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, not, uh, uh, no, I wasn't a trial judge. Do you think that handicapped you in any way, or do you think that wasn't really a problem for you? I don't, it really wasn't a problem for me, you know. Uh, I had tried several cases uh, before going to the legislature. I, I, put my, I started practicing, uh, what was it, in 1953. And I took, I, won, I took one case up to the Supreme Court. I told you about that case where I reversed the fifth, you know, the guest statute case. But I had some great experiences with judges, and I was always admired judges who uh, who were objective at, at that level it was very important yeah there was a judge here in this town uh, by the name of Mardikian George Mardikian who a Republican that would have been uh, Robert wouldn't it Robert uh, Robert, Mardikian? Robert, yeah. Robert Mardikian you know he was a huge man you know and a good attorney and he was appointed uh, I forget who appointed him but uh, I supported his elevation to the uh, fifth district court of appeals 
As I recall, for Superior Court, he, I believe Mardikin was a Republican, and he was appointed by uh, Governor Brown, if I'm right, not mistaken, right, in right, the Superior right. Court. Yeah. George Duke Mason wouldn't appoint him. <laughs> that may be a whole different story <laughs> that uh, might uh, require a different day. Right. But uh, in any event, when you were on the um, uh, Court of Appeal, that was a five-year period, and you've talked about the fact that you joined uh, three uh, sitting justices at that time, uh, replacing Justice Gargano. But by the time you left the court five years later, the court had expanded to eight. Right. So this, this was a time of rapid growth uh, oh, with the yeah. addition of uh, additional judicial uh, positions. Um, and you've already told us a little bit about the, uh, the three justices that you sat with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, P.J. George Brown, uh, uh, Justice Donald Franson Sr., and then uh, Justice uh, George Hopper, who was legendary for his feistiness. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember when died I died in office. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they always used to tell me, don't <clears throat> let him hopperize you. <laughs> well, explain to our <laughs> listeners what it, what it means to be hopperized, <laughs> if, if you recall. Uh, I remember the, uh, the sheriff of this town at that time, a guy named McKinney. Uh, I forget his first name. Hal McKinney. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but he said, I always had to be careful with George Hopper on the municipal court because George was, you know, on the Munich court for a long time. And he said... Uh, he would hopperize you, which in essence meant he would prevail upon you to give him, for you to do what he wanted you to do in connection with a given case. You know? I remember as a young attorney being hopperized myself. Uh, uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, Inter any, he was really a very interesting guy. Very much so. Uh, any other thoughts on those three? Uh, I think you probably said uh, you know, what you thought of them. Yeah. Well, you know, just talking about George Hopper, now here's a guy. Uh, who really didn't have much of a trial practice, he specialized in creating cities in the San Joaquin Valley and in Fresno County. He created several cities. I don't know how many, but I know he was a city attorney of all these cities that he eventually created. So that was his specialty, and that's what he brought to the Court of Appeal. Quite a varied group, as, oh, as yeah. we've talked about already. Yeah. Then, uh, less than a year after you joined the court, Governor Jerry Brown appointed uh, Justice Pauline Hanson to the court, who was, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, both the first woman to serve as a uh, Superior Court judge in this uh, judicial right. district, in this uh, district, and also the, the first to serve on this court itself. Uh, she, like uh, Justice Hopper, uh, tragically died while in office. Uh, yeah. Her death came, I believe, in 1987. Uh, any particular recollections about Pauline Hanson you wish to share? Very capable lady and very uh, easy to work with and uh, to do, you know, in, involved in deliberations. She very knowledgeable in the law. She'd worked for the first PJ of this court, a man named Conley, Philip Conley. She was his uh, administrative assistant or whatever they called him at that time. She was his chief legal consultant, as I, re well, as I recall. So she had a lot to do with his involvement. On she may case. have been the principal attorney, if not at that time, at some point of, yeah. of the court. Yes. Of, the, of the whole total court, yes. yeah. But, uh, you know, I remember that because uh, that was part of, uh, of the reasons that she was appointed to the Superior Court because of that background, because she didn't, have, didn't try any cases either, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a constant question <coughs> in, in appellate strategy. You know, should you appoint someone who has never had the trial experience over someone who is, in a sense, an academic or came from some other section of government? And I, I, I think it's, well, look at the, the U.S. Supreme Court over the years, you know. I can't recall any specific cases here in the California court, uh, particularly the Supreme Court. But it's, it's something to be concerned about. Then from about late 1980 until uh, 1982, this was the period of the rapid growth of the court, uh, four new members came on the bench, uh, Justices Ken Andreen, Wixon Wolpert, uh, Charles Hamlin, and, and Robert Martin. Uh, any thoughts about um, how that affected the operation of the court, basically doubling or, or any of the additions well, of these individuals? Well, that's in effect what it did. It just did. Double the, in, double the uh, input and output of the court, new, new faces, new people, and, uh, you know, it, 
the, the PJ had more work to do with, with more people. And uh, he was uh, really a very capable guy and knew how to, how to separate the, 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 the various panels uh, for the various issues, you know, which was very important. I remember in that context, you know, I told you about the Agricultural Labor Relations Act, and I was one of the principal co-authors. When I came here, that court, that case, the constitutionality of that statute was filed in this court. And uh, George Brown, at that time, uh, decided that uh, he picked a panel, and the panel consisted of himself, uh, Don Franson, and me. And I remember the... Uh, uh, the Chavez folks, you know, the, uh, they decided that they didn't want me having anything to do with that case because I was involved in the deliberations in the legislature. So they challenged my status uh, as a member of that, of the three, you know. And they, I, I refused. I decided that I wanted to do it and I wanted to rule on it. And uh, I had the encouragement of George, uh, George Brown and Don Franson. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court sustained my position. I didn't have to recuse myself. And in the end, the decision was a three-zap decision, finding the Agricultural Labor Relations Act constitutional. I came across a, a daily uh, journal profile on you. I think it was published about in 1982. And uh, you're described there as one not regarding yourself on your job or your job with much pretension. Uh, in fact, I think that was a description you gave uh, the particular uh, writer of that, uh, that article, that profile. Uh, any changes in that perspective as we sit here 24 years later? No. Still the same. Uh, even when I put that robe on to conduct a marriage ceremony, I'm still George. <laughs> you know, and that was one of the things that just used to disturb me from time to time, sitting with various people. Once they put that robe on, they change, you know. Not me. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't a good thing or something. I don't know. Well, I, I, think, I think that has served you well throughout your, your, your various careers. Um, but let me ask you this. Of, of the cases uh, that you have authored, any, any favorites? I know we've talked about some of them that you've been involved in, but do you have any favorite cases of those? Well, God, it's been such a long time. The Bond case is probably one of the most important, in my opinion. I remember uh, the reaction after that because that literally kept these folks in business. Yeah, that would have been uh, County of Fresno versus Malmstrom, I believe, yeah, uh, in 1979. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that certainly was a case of big impact because yeah. you had the Proposition 13 and right. governments, and I think you already described this to some right. extent, governments... Uh, with very limited funding, and this allowed special districts uh, in bonds. That's right. Uh, to issue those bonds without a vote. Right. Uh, uh, the other thing that was, I, I, I was in, I, the, the, the California Housing Finance Act was another thing that I was very proud of, and uh, it was, I would say that was one of, the, one of the pieces of legislation that I most fond of. The other thing I carried, you know, I used to carry a lot of little things that people never really concerned. When I was in the member, when I was in the assembly, uh, a family flying from Oregon down to the Bay Area in an airplane uh, crashed, and uh, I remember that, that was my first year in the legislature. And uh, a daughter, one, there was a mother and a father and a daughter, and the daughter survived, and they were looking for her, looking for the wreckage and all of that, and couldn't find it or anything, you know. And uh, so one day, the, girl, the little girl shows up. She was about 10 or 12 years old, shows up in some town up there in Northern California, and she survived. So I remember when I was in the Army Air Corps during the war, we used to call it the Army Air Corps, uh, I did a lot of flying in the Pacific. And, you know, flying in the Pacific, I was a radio operator and looking out that, looking out of that window and all that, water and jungle, mm -hmm. I figured, I used to say, my God, if you ever get down here, then never, nobody will ever find us. And they had some downed aircraft locators at that time in some of these B-24s. And I remembered that, and I was in one that had one. So I introduced the bill to require uh, 
pilots to put these down aircraft locators in their airplanes. And the pilots in the legislature went crazy. But this was a first impression bill, and it was unbelievable. And I went, uh, there was some company from uh, Canada that built these things. And so we went up to Canada for a simulated finding in connection with an accident, and it was really very exciting. And eventually this became law. There was a pilot from Colorado or something in the, in the Congress, I forget his name, uh, but he introduced the bill. And so as a result of my bill becoming the first in this country in applying to California, he introduced the bill, making it applicable to the whole country. So downed aircraft locators are me. <laughs> and, and while downed uh, aircraft uh, carriers, is that what you called it? Yeah. I, downed aircraft locators. Locators, excuse me. Yeah. Downed aircraft locators. While um, that may not have been something that you had any, anything to deal with as a justice on the court, that yeah. might not have been anything. There were a lot of things that you did deal with in the legislature that, um, as you've already said, uh, would come up in the appellate court and your fellow justices might have been asking your viewpoints on yeah. it. And I know that uh, during the time that you were a member of the legislature, uh, this was a time when, when California took the lead nationally in prolifically uh, enacting numerous consumer protection laws. Oh, yeah. Reese Levering, Song Beverly, there, there were several of those during, during your tenure in the legislature. Now you're a justice of the Court of Appeal. And in 1984, you, you get a case involving a uh, dealership, uh, Toyota Visalia, who had a little run-in with the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, did you recall that case by any chance? I vaguely recall <laughs> it, but I, he, he was using some kind of a gimmick uh, that turned out to be bad. Well, I, I happened to take a look at that case, and uh, it was a situation where the... Um, uh, the dealer himself, I believe his name was Otmar Thomas, he would go on TV and he would offer a free gift with a purchase of a vehicle. When in fact, one could buy the same vehicle for a price minus the cost of the so-called gift. And uh, in that case, uh, you did agree with the trial court's finding that uh, this violated the prohibition of false and misleading advertising. Uh, there is a vehicle code section uh, that, that uh, covered that, 11,713. But I guess my question is, uh, do you have any particular thoughts about consumer protection laws and uh, the fact that they are enacted and the courts are called upon to, to enforce them? Very much so. It's very important uh, to uh, protect the rights of consumers, and the court is the last resort. I mean, if you, know, if you're, if you think you've been had, uh, you've got to file an action and uh, make an effort to have it decided. And that's the way I, f I felt about it as a member of the legislature and even when I came up here. I remember that case. That was an As a matter of fact, I think that case came out of George Mardikian's trial court when he was a trial judge. But I remember that guy advertising on television. It was phony, you know. So th there's got to be a check on a, this kind of activity, and the court is the proper place. That's why when I told you early on, once the courts go in this country, it's all over with, as far as I'm concerned. You have some very strong feelings very, there about the separation very of much powers. Very on separation of powers. And, uh, and I don't care whether the courts are conservative or whether they're liberal. It doesn't make that much difference. And to me, someday when somebody's watching this and listening to this, who knows what the status of this state and this country might be in that, in that connection. It's very important to think about this because that... that that line is a very thin line, in my opinion, you know, the constitutionality issue. It's a very thin line. It could go one way or the other. You talked a little bit about this, uh, having been a primary author of the Agricultural Label Labor Relations Act. That's a mouthful to get out all at once. <laughs> the ALRA. Yeah. Uh, and how uh, even though you actually enacted this legislation that, that you were... Uh, uh, asked to recuse yourself, and, and you did stay on the case that you mentioned. There, there was another case in, um, in 1980, Dan Tudor and Sons versus the ALRB, that reversed the ALRB's finding that the employer had willfully engaged in a pattern of wrongful surveillance of farm worker employees. And uh, uh, again, I, and along the same vein, did, uh, did you have any... Uh, 
feelings that maybe you should take yourself off of a case as, such as this because you enacted the, the law itself? Or uh, did you feel you could be fair and there was no reason why you, given the amount that you had studied this issue, that you uh, were in fact maybe even better qualified to hear those kinds That's of issues? That's it. I just felt I could be fair under the circumstances. I remember that case, you know, and I ruled, I mean, the uh, ag labor people were really hot about that. I mean, they had a very attractive attorney that used to come before the fifth. I forget her name. She was a blonde, and she represented uh, Cesar Chavez and, uh, and the union. And, uh, boy, she always used to make an eyeball pitch at me <laughs> on any case that she argued to make sure that I knew where she was coming from. It was very interesting. So I shocked her when, I guess I must have shocked her when I voted finding the ALRA constitutional and then voting... And when I voted then uh, uh, on the, this last case, what was the name of that guy? Uh, that was Dan Tudor. In Dan Senate. Tudor. When I voted to support Dan Tudor uh, against the labor union. <laughs> now, that particular opinion was originally published in 1980, uh, then later depublished by the state Supreme Court. You know, and, you know, we as appellate just justices, that's kind of a mystery to us. Yeah. We don't know why a case maybe is depublished by the Supreme Court. Uh, did they, is there a feeling that the ruling was wrong? Is it maybe something they just don't want to be in the uh, published uh, group of cases? Uh, we never really know uh, in those kinds of situations. And there has been some criticism of the depublication process. And over the years, sometimes it's happening more frequently, other times less frequently. Uh, do you have any, any uh, particular thoughts about the ability of the Supreme Court to depublish a court of appeal decision without stating any reasons as to why? Yeah, I, I don't like that, <laughs> frankly. Uh, and I don't know how this ever came about, but uh, I think that uh, probably from a historical standpoint, you know, like a lot of things have been done in secret over the years, and so that's it. Uh, frankly, I, you know, I remember we used to discuss here on the 5th about whether, we, whether something should be published or not, you know. And I, I had a strict rule, I always used to say here on the 5th, that if it's something, if it's not a first impression case, something of first impression, uh, we shouldn't publish it. And there was a lot of disagreement uh, over that very issue. So I can imagine now, you know, talking about the Supreme Court, let's see, who, who could, was Roseburg the Chief Justice when that happened, I wonder? I believe so, yes. Yeah, well, that tells you something. Well, Although I have the greatest respect for that woman, in my opinion, she was a great chief justice and a very capable woman. And I remember her in the in the legislature when I was a member of the legislature. She was the uh, director of uh, agriculture and consumer affairs for Jerry Brown. So that's probably something that <laughs> was done after five o'clock one day. <laughs> you know, you, you touched upon this a little bit. That that whole decision-making process among the three justices on a panel as to whether to publish a particular mm -hmm. case. And you gave us a little bit of insight into how that process worked for you. Today, uh, there is currently a, a movement among many in the statewide legal community that all cases uh, should be published. What do you think about that? I don't think that's... Uh, I, I don't agree with that, frankly. My gosh. I mean, a lot of Issues are repetitious. They've been ruled upon, stare decisis, and all of that. You know, you know why create more of a library <laughs> when you don't have to? You know, uh, I, I remember on the fifth. Every now and then, we used to get complaints from uh, from attorneys when we didn't publish something. You know, and uh, and I always stuck by my position that in this, I thought it was a first impression. It shouldn't be published. But who knows? Maybe things are going to change and everything's going to be published. Well, of course, it doesn't have to be printed in a, in a book with, uh, with a binding. It can be uh, on the television screen or the computer screen, you know. And in so fact, in, in nowadays, for a limited time, unpublished cases are available oh, they are. on the Internet. Uh, uh, but, of course, you still can't cite those cases yeah, uh, yeah. in court. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Now... Um, the courts have had to deal many times with uh, issues concerning initiatives, such as Proposition 13. Do you have any particular thoughts about the initiative process as a means of legislating? 
It's a terrible way to legislate, in my opinion. I've opposed initiatives from day one, even before I went to the legislature. Uh, you know, how can anybody vote for a proposition that's never been scrutinized, that there's never been any hearings on with, in connection with what it does and how it operates, pro or con, and, and, and make that vote count as a vote that is a conscientious vote for something like that, you know. I remember that Rose Bird uh, dissenting opinion on Proposition 13. And what she said in that dissent opinion is exactly what happened. You know, you're my next door neighbor. <laughs> and your house was valued at, uh, say, $100,000. And my house was valued at $100,000. So I sell my house. <laughs> and the, the value goes up. And, uh, but you continue to live next door to me all these years. And the guy who bought from me has got to pay more in taxes than you do. And the guy that bought from him has got to pay more in taxes, property taxes, than he did and than you do. So uh, there was a disparity there. So that person who decided to stay in that home for the rest of his life for, for a good number of years is getting a tax break, in my opinion, because he's not paying for the, his fair share or her fair share of what's going on in the county. And I think people's feelings about that will continue over the years of course, as, uh, of course. as those laws continue. And the other thing, the fact that it doesn't apply to industry, you know, then, yeah, yeah. It's, it's something to think about. I was against Prop 13 at the time. People thought I was crazy. But You've uh, shared with us, uh, and it's really been enjoyable talking about some of these issues uh, that involve the legislature vis-a-vis -vis the um, judiciary. Uh, any other thoughts or impressions about the interplay between uh, these two branches of government, the legislature and uh, the judiciary? Well, as I told you from the outset, once the courts go in this country, it's all over with. And so uh, I look to the courts as, 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 as the ultimate solution. And I accept that, whether that court is a conservative court or whether it's a liberal court. I mean, that's the name of the game in the U.S. In my opinion, that's the name of a free society. And uh, I just hate to see people in constantly introducing bills to reverse the decision of, of a Supreme Court, you know. But then who knows whether I'm right on that. Uh, I can imagine that those debates eventually will be so significant you know, and they'll say, for example, well, there was only nine people on that court that decided, <laughs> or only seven people on that court that decided. We're here in, in California in the legislature, and, and uh, you know, we got 80 people that can decide one way or another, you know. I mean, it, it's, it's going to be tough, and that's why I want, that's one reason that I'm against initiatives. I, I never vote for an initiative that's instituted outside of the legislature, you know. And if, after all, when you think about it, Hiram Johnson, who was then the governor, I mean, the only reason he did that was to break up the railroad monopoly. The railroads in this country own the state of California. And that was his reason, because he could never get a legislator to vote against the railroads because of the lobbying and the money connections. It's a very interesting bit of history. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, let, me, let me take you back to that, that 1982 Daily Journal article that I, that I looked up and read a little bit about you. Um, the, uh, the writer of that article evidently introduced, uh, or excuse me, interviewed two uh, attorneys who had appeared in court before you, and he gave a somewhat different, uh, got somewhat different views from those two individuals. One said, you had an engaging personality and great common sense. The other said, you were an intellectual leader of the court. How would you describe <laughs> your, your strengths as a jurist? I was just a common sense guy. I'm no intellectual. <laughs> My wife doesn't think I'm intellectual at all. You know? And others, I just, I was, it was a common sense type of thing, and maybe that involves being intellectual, so be it. You know? I think but this takes us back to you not being pretentious about yeah, any yeah, way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
that's very refreshing. Um, what did you enjoy most about being a jurist uh, during the time you were at the Court of Appeal? Well, when I was on the Court of Appeal, frankly, uh, when there were just four of us here, uh, this court was a delightful court. And the camaraderie was fantastic. And uh, I remember even though George, George was kind of conservative, and he was a, you know, he came from a, uh, that big firm in Los, in Bakersfield that he helped farm, and they, I guess they represented a lot of defendants. The, the Wharton Bort, Petrini firm, yeah. I believe you're referring to. Yes. And, and, you know, he didn't like uh, these plaintiffs, lawyers. <laughs> And he used to always give him a bad time, you know. And here were you, a plaintiff's lawyer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we had a mix, you know. I'll never forget some of those discussions that George would say, oh, he's lying. You know? <laughs> I said, no way. <laughs> so we had a mix on cases, and I'll never forget. It was just, it would depend on the panel, whether it was George, Franson, and me, or J Hopper, Franson, and me. <laughs> I, I wish I could have... Um... Been, been a fly on the wall during some of those discussions that the uh, four of you had. Well, yeah, there was an interesting writ guy up here at that time named Don Horvath. Do you know him? Yes. Is he still around? Don Horvath is still around. He's had some cases in our court here really? in recent years, yes. Kind of a snob, but God, what a bright guy. And he, I guess, he, he, he replaced Eric here, didn't he? Uh, or no, Eric replaced him, is that yes. it? Yes, yeah. yes, our current uh, principal writ attorney is Eric? Uh, replaced uh, Don Horvath, Don Horvath and, that, yeah. and he is still here today, yes, Eric Walton. Yeah, That's well, great. Eric, kind of a quiet guy, you know, but I remember that uh, Horvath used to get into big arguments with us, you know, with, with George Brown or me or Hopper, and we'd have it out, you know. But I, guess, I guess Horvath would lose those arguments. So. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes he won. <laughs> he did win a few, huh? Yeah. Uh, on that subject, uh, did... Stop you just yes. for a minute. George Duke Magian, because he could have been on the Supreme, he could have been the chief. Absolutely. But that in that infighting, George was mad at him because he voted, he gave Coleman Bleas an approve for the Third District Court of Appeal. Yeah. Yeah, Pooley was another guy that, that could have well been. We're ready to continue? Okay. Well, here, I'll put this back. Let me ask you this. What do you think has changed the most in our courts since you left the bench in 1984, bringing it up to today? What, what do you think has changed the most? Well, it's hard to say. I think at the, at the superior court level, you know, uh, uh, there's a big effort to move the trials along much quicker than uh, when I was around, and that's happening, so that's expediting the process. I think that's happening as a lot here, too, uh, at the appellate level, and particularly the Supreme Court level, with that 90-day rule. I mean, that 90-day rule is still in effect. Yes. And uh, I remember that was, George Brown used to, he was really concerned about that. He wanted an opinion out in 90 days. and. Excuse me, he didn't get mad at you if it wasn't out in 90 days, but he sure let you know he was unhappy. So I think that that's one of the things that the courts, since I've gone, have expedited the process to, you know, give the people what they need and uh, just due process. Okay. Can't, keep, can't keep people waiting too long. Now we're going to step back a little bit and go back to find out a little bit about this person behind uh, this legislative and judicial career. Uh, so we're going to take ourselves back to your earlier years and some of your recollections. Uh, here you are, you're a, a Fresno native, you were born here in 1922, and you spent your formative years attending local schools until your service in the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps, which you've told us a little bit about in the Pacific Theater from uh, 1943 to 1946. Please tell us a little bit about the people and any experiences in those early years here in Fresno that had a great impact on you. Well, Fresno was really a small town in those days. You know, when I went to grammar school here, my goodness, what, 30,000 people, 40,000 people came here. 
And uh, my father had a restaurant. He was in the restaurant business. And uh, so I used to spend a lot of time in the kitchen washing dishes <laughs> with my brother. Two of us would be the, the principal dishwashers when the dishwasher wouldn't show, you know. So uh, I, thinking back about grammar school, uh, there was one teacher that I thought a uh, very significant lady that I met. Her name was uh, Mrs. Brown, and she, uh, she had a tremendous influence on my life. And then when I went to junior high school, uh, I was involved in music, you know, I, I played the violin as a, as a younger kid, and so I played in the All City Symphony or Orchestra. And a woman that I met there, her name was Gaguyan, Alice, Alice Gaguyan. She was a lovely lady, musical teacher, taught music at Washington Junior High School and then later at Fresno High School. Tremendous influence on my life. And uh, beyond that, at Fresno State College, uh, many, many people that I touched base with, uh, you know, very significant relationships. Uh, I remember when I first came back, uh, you know, we had a, Fresno State College had engaged, uh, they were set to play a football game in Oklahoma. I don't know whether you ever remembered this, and uh, there was two black guys on the Fresno State football team, Jack Kelly, who's a retired policeman from Fresno, and a guy named Millard Mitchell. I was student president at the time. This was in 1946, right after the war. And here I'd come back, you know, we were fighting to keep the peace and equality for everybody. And uh, the Oklahoma uh, Department of Athletics informed in the Fresno State Department of Athletics that the two black guys can't play. So that was a really a tremendous thing happening to me, even though before that, when we first went in, this guy Kelly, he and I have been fairly close over the years. Uh, when we, we were drafted together and went to uh, Monterey together, and our groups, there was about 10 or 12 of us, and after we got to Monterey to Fort Ord, we went to get a beer, and they wouldn't serve us because Jack Kelly was black and with us. I mean, this was in 1943, buddy. <laughs> so you can imagine what was going on in the South at that time, you know, and how that was being reacted to. So then come back to 1946, and they won't let Jack Kelly play football in Oklahoma. <laughs> so that was a tremendous thing in my life and I touched base with a lot of people there. I remember I tried to prevail upon the, the president of the college at that time, a guy named Frank Thomas. I tried to prevail upon him to cancel the game <laughs> and he wouldn't. And then there was a dean, the dean of men, I forget his name. Uh, oh, well. But I, I, you know, in that maneuver I was student president and I was leading this movement and we had a lot of support to cancel the games. As a matter of fact, a lot of the students were willing to contribute. It was a $2,000 forfeiture fine or something if we, couldn't, if we didn't play the games. And a lot of the students were willing to contribute money to enact the forfeiture clause so that we didn't have to go. But we finally went, and uh, Fresno State really got beat. <laughs> what, what an interesting story, and certainly yeah. that uh, uh, demonstrated in early years your, uh, your leadership yeah. and sense of justice and law. Right, right. Uh, that's right. a tremendous story. Uh, yeah, I see Kelly. He's still around. <laughs> he became a police officer, yeah. as I recall. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's quite a man. Yeah, I think his son runs the African Museum here in, uh, in Fresno. But, uh, so we, you know, gotten a lot of things together. Yes. Um, but the, the real jolt was Fort Ord when the bartender wouldn't serve a beer to us because of the guy with us. <laughs> yes, it's amazing, like you say, in the, in the 1940s, right, uh, right. still de dealing with issues that right. uh, should have been resolved more than 80 years before that. There you go. Um, you touched upon something, your, your violin playing, because I know as I've read some of your 
biographies, there's quite a bit of mention of your musical skill over the years and uh, your your musician talents. And I know you played uh, or, and still play a number of instruments. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how music has impacted your life? Well, it's really impacted my life. And, and from the time that I was first in grammar school, I remember my mother, there was a solicitation in the neighborhood. Some guy came into town and he wanted to teach violin to kids. And uh, so for X number of dollars, for X number of lessons, blah, blah, blah. That's how I started. So I started on the violin. And uh, that was in uh, the sixth or seventh grade. And then uh, as I, wherever I found myself at, in an educational level, I always joined the orchestra, which was very important to me, very important to me. And uh, I was the concert master of the uh, Fresno High School Symphony, or the Fresno High School Orchestra, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when I was there then. And uh, always, and then uh, there was a there was a, a, a fellow by the name of Shuck, Lennel Shuck, who was the one of the top people in the music area under the Fresno Unified School District, and he created a uh, all city symphony. So it was very interesting. Um, kids from every high school in town back in those days that had any talent uh, would audition for this symphony and. I wound up on that symphony. I didn't wind up as a concertmaster. I was assistant concertmaster. But then I remember some students from Edison, some students from Roosevelt, uh, you know, from other schools. I don't think, what's the name of this new high school out here? The Bullard wasn't even in existence then. So it's been a part of my life, and, and I think that it's had a lot to do with my makeup. and. My thinking capacities. I remember, uh, I don't remember the, the precise philosophy of Shuck, but he always used to say, you need, you need to know something about music because music involves counting, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, it'll help you with your math. <laughs> it was very interesting, this guy, uh, you know, how he, how he made music a part of your life as a student to augment whatever you were thinking about doing. Then when I went to Fresno State College, uh, there was a man out there, Dr. Berdahl, uh, who was uh, the head of the music department, and uh, he wanted me in the symphony, but he didn't want me as a violinist. He looked at my hands and he said, you got big hands, George. Those are viola hands <laughs> and viola fingers. And he said, you got to play viola with us because we need some more violas. We got lots of violins. So that's what happened. I started playing the viola, a lovely instrument. And at the same time, I got involved with the string bass, uh, which really sustained me in my later years uh, in law school, uh, because in Los An I'm a life member of Local 47 in Los Angeles. When I went down to Southwestern down there, I joined uh, Local 47. and. Uh, you know, I remember the guy that I was living with in those days. He was a student with me. He's a lawyer in Oakland now. And I remember he was pumping gas on the weekends at a standard station there in Los Angeles for, just for the sake of the comparison, say $10 a weekend. And as a musician and a member of the local musicians union in Los Angeles, I was working a weekend for $20. <laughs> Good money in those days, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have told us, you know, that you did attend uh, uh, South Southwestern University right, Law right. School after you returned home from the war and finished your degree at Fresno State. Uh, what most influenced your decision to study law? I guess my dad. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I think basically I wanted to be a musician. I think that was my underlying desire. What did your dad have to say about that? He didn't like that. He didn't like that. Coming from Europe, you know, musicians are gypsies. <laughs> Unless you're a classical musician, I guess, you know. So he didn't like that. And uh, who knows, maybe things would have been much different. So that's how I decided to, to go into the law. And uh, here I am. Maybe some of those experiences at Fresno State, maybe. Uh 
Yeah. Some of the issues of uh, justice and equality. Oh, yeah. That, that might have had an influence, huh? Yeah. Uh, I understand you had some very interesting travels not long after you graduated from law school and passed the bar. Uh, could you share some of those experiences with us? Yeah, well, when I came back uh, after I passed the bar, uh, you know, I, 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 the usual thing here in Fresno at that time was to go to work for the DA. <laughs> yeah, but I came back when the DA, there was a big campaign, and I supported the wrong guy. There was a guy I supported a guy named Stanton Levy. <laughs> and the DA at that time was uh, Clark Savory, you know. And so when I went to see Clark about a job, he says, no, you were with the wrong guy. I mean, that was a good experience for me. It turned me on, you know. It, it, it gave me some idea what it, when you take a position politically like that, what it, the consequences are going to be. So then I wound up uh, in a solo practice. Now, what was your question again? I, I, I was asking you, I, I know when you came back to Fresno, uh, you decided to do a little traveling before oh, you got yeah, deeply yeah. into the practice. So anyway, of law. Yeah. you know, I was around for a couple of years, and I saw at that time none of these attorneys were ever going anywhere on vacation. They were working around the clock. You know, I remember a guy named Gaspar McGarrian. <laughs> I mean, I used to follow Gaspar around because he was a probate expert. That guy worked 24/7 then. You know, and so you know, I said, my God, maybe I. Before I really get involved in this, I mean, look at what these other guys, these other guys are not going anywhere, not even going to Vegas, let alone L.A. or San Francisco. So uh, maybe I better, or Europe. So I decided to save up some money and go to Europe and see, go to Yugoslavia where my people came from and sort of visit, uh, visit my family and the heritage and, and see what, where I came from, you know. I guess this was during 1953, 1954, yeah, during yeah, that time. Yeah. Uh, I understand that uh, your travels took you to The Hague. And yeah. You spent a little time there as well. Right, right. I went, uh, I went, uh, it was a very interesting trip. I went on a, uh, it was a German steamship with, uh, no, Greek, with a, with a German crew. And the first stop was in Ireland, at Cove, Ireland. And uh, that's when I remember I, I, I met a Catholic priest on the ship, and he talked me into getting off the boat. I was going to go to Bremerhaven and then take the train from Bremerhaven to uh, Montenegro, Yugoslavia, where my aunt was waiting for me. She waited for me all summer. <laughs> but I got off with this priest in Cove and then stayed in Ireland, kissed the Blarney Stone, <laughs> and then went on to England. And in England, I met a refugee from Yugoslavia who was sort of a third cousin or something who was there with his family and he said well while you're here why don't you try to get it uh, go to school here you know and I said well I don't know whether I can do that I don't have the money and he said you don't need any money and then he said something about the Hague and uh, so that's when I began making inquiries and uh, I went to the Hague and that was an interesting summer uh, at The Hague. and uh, At the International Academy of Law there. The International Academy of Law. And then uh, at the end of the summer, I found my way down to Yugoslavia, and my aunt gave up hope. She thought I was never going to make it. <laughs> she thought you would never make it there. But once you did make it there, uh, I understand you met a young lady there. Could you right, tell us a little right. about her? I met a young law. So she had just graduated from law school at the University of Sarajevo. And we met on the beach, and that's how it all started. She is now Mrs. Innovich, is yeah, that right. correct? And yeah. she, she has been for 50-some years. Okay. <laughs> More than 50, anyway. More than 50, 50-plus. 50 50. Yes. Um, you are rightfully proud of your Serbian heritage. Yeah. Uh, how has this affected your life? Well... It, it's it's been good for me because it gave me a chance to look into the history of the Serbs and what they had done and the contributions that they've made over the years uh, in Serbia and in Yugoslavia. By the way, I did get to meet Tito, you know, the uh, the president of Yugoslavia. I was on a couple of delegations. 
and uh, it's it's had a tremendous impact because my frankly I couldn't my first language was Serbo Serbian what they call a Serbo Croatian at that time and I when I first went to Lowell Grammar School I couldn't speak English but just a very little bit and uh, my principal language was uh, Serbian so I had to change that so uh, it's had a, a big influence on my life. After all those travels, it was time to get back to the practice time of law. Time to get back into the Time to get down to business. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your law practice, what it was like. Well, when I first came back, like I told you, I tried to get a job with, uh, with Clark Savory, and he turned me down. So then it was just a question of doing something on my own. And uh, that's what I did. I opened up shop on my own in the Security Pacific building. And uh, in those days, the, uh, the, uh, there was no public defender, so the judges used to hire uh, the younger attorneys, guys right out of law school. I think it was for, 20, for a plea, $25 for a plea, and $50 a day for uh, trying cases. So I, you know, worked on that. And then I got involved with a young developer, uh, here in Fresno. His name was Alan Prezi, and he um, really developed the whole North End before anybody else was at it. He was a good friend of Max Hayden. You remember Max Hayden? Yes. He was the attorney here. And uh, he got me involved in, in setting up these special districts like water districts and street districts, lighting districts. There was a lighting district. Uh, issue and I read about it in the B the other day the people didn't don't want to pay the uh, the fee anymore I Fresno formed where that, are you yeah, yeah I formed that lighting district back in 1962 uh, they didn't call me and ask me what I thought about <laughs> paying the fee was all about but I I formed it it was it was one of the first lighting districts in the state of California and I remember it was very interesting because John Bonadelli was a developer, and he had a guy working for him named Ed Cashin. And together, we walked the beat to get people to sign to form this lighting district. And I was surprised when I picked up the beat and said they wouldn't pay $17 a year to keep the lights on. <laughs> Isn't that something? So that took me to another area. So I began developing some real estate law, and then uh, it was just a general practice. Whatever came in, if I thought I could handle it, I, could, I would handle it. And then that gave me some insight uh, among others, attorneys in town, one of which was Bob Sears. As a matter of fact, the guest statute case was a case that went to Bob Sears first. So I got a lot of referrals in those days, and Bob sent me that case. So I had a mix, you know, some personal injury, a little bit of probate, a little bit of land development, and a little bit of criminal law. The twenty-five dollars a plea. <laughs> I think you've already largely told us uh, about how your your early practice affected your life as a jurist. Uh, any other comments you want to make about that? Uh, any impressions other than we've talked about the guest statute, the former guest statute? Uh, anything else that that um, left you quite an impression that affected your 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 life as a jurist? Consumer issues. I think that was the most significant. I used to have people walk in, you know, and explain situations to me that were deplorable. Consumer situations. And so that's one of the reasons that I got involved in handling those kinds of cases. And that's one of the reasons that I was involved in, uh, in Sacramento on consumer legislation. That very much so. And I used to, you know, I. I didn't like the criminal law, uh, but you know, I, I, I was fairly good before a jury. Uh, and uh, even though in my heart I knew he was guilty, I could make a good pitch before a jury, and many times the defendant walked. Yes. <laughs> Some good lawyers. But never telling me that he really did it or she really did it. I think a lot of criminal lawyers have that situation uh, yeah. for them. But let's, let's talk a little bit about the differences uh, 
practicing law in the 50s and the 60s, other than the fact you might only get 20 or $25 uh, uh, for a criminal <laughs> uh, law representation, uh, an appointment case. Um, anything else during the 50s and 60s really different when compared with today? I guess other than the size and the volume. and you, you Well, that's a big difference, size and volume, you know. New people, new people. You know, I, I tend to read the obituaries every day. <laughs> so many of my friends have left. Certainly. You know, it, it's, it's, and I'm wondering when, when it's going to happen. But it... Uh, Do you think things are any less collegial today? I mean, was it more uh, people really knew each other then and yeah. less so today, more depersonalized today? I think it's more depersonalized today. People really knew each other in those days and did a lot of things together. And uh, they weren't that antagonistic. And I think maybe the, the international situations has something to do with this, you know. Who knows what any person might be thinking about at any given time during the day, you know, in connection with what was happening then to him or to her. I think this international situation has really, really affected people who think about life. And once that happens, then that takes away, you know, the cooperati cooperation and the congenial, congenial feelings. Let, let's go a little bit fast forward. We're talking here in the 60s. Let's um, take you to... Uh, uh, the time that you're retiring from the bench, it's 1984, and uh, actually you hardly retired at all, it seems to me. You resumed your law practice, yeah. and you did a, a business called Government Advocation. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your work and any other activities that you might want to share from those uh, post-bench days. Well, that's what eventually happened. I, uh, I started to, uh, I was a lobbyist. I, after I finished, I t went up to Sacramento and uh, had several different clients uh, that I represented, and that's what I did. I uh, I was representing these folks before the legislature, and uh, it was good for me. I mean, it helped pay the bills and a little more, you know. And the fact that I was an ex-legislator did help, and the fact that I was a former member of the court did help. So I decided that I would you know, try to handle this as best I could, and I did. And then uh, I worked for several different firms. Uh, people do, used to tell me that I should open my own firm, and I didn't. I never felt that I was going to spend that much time up there, you know, for a long time, in years. So that's why I never really uh, opened my own firm. I know that your family uh, is and has been very important to you. Um, and we talked about how you met your, your wife of 51 years, Vera. Uh, tell us a little bit about her, and you've already, you already told us about her having a legal background. Yeah. Tell us she about should have her. been a lawyer. Okay. I'm very sorry that I never, I never, I should have made her go to law school here because, you know, she would have been a great lawyer. She's a great cross-examiner. And uh, She never cross-examines you, does she? No. <laughs> Tell us a little bit also about your daughters. Uh, well, one of my daughters works uh, for the Screenwriters Guild in Los Angeles. They both went to USC. Uh, uh, the other one uh, is an independent uh, movie producer, and she does a lot of work with... Uh, uh, oh, God, I'm running out of gas here. Uh, Can we just stop for a minute? Can I go back on here? And pick it up, put that back. Go ahead and put that back there. And ready to talk. Yeah, Marina is a, a documentary filmmaker. And uh, she's doing one right now on, uh, what was his name? I told you, the Frenchman, uh, the movie director. Uh, I think you're thinking of Roman Polanski. Roman Polanski, right. So uh, she's had some success doing this, and uh, she's married to a, a writer from London, England. 
So she has an interesting life between Los Angeles and New York and London. So the kids are, you know, doing okay. And uh, well, that's it. I imagine you're very proud of your daughters. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, are there any words of advice that you would have for any new lawyers, judges, or lawmakers? Well, new lawyers, I remember uh, when I first started in the legislature, I was advised to listen and not talk. So I think this is important. If you're going to be a lawyer, you should make a new lawyer. You should make a, an effort to listen to what others are saying and what others are doing, and then eventually speak up. Same thing in the legislature. So I think it's important to understand the issues that you're confronted with, and you got to be a good listener to to understand all of that. For a judge, uh, things for the judge, in my opinion, a, a good background uh, on life, <coughs> I think it's very, very, very important. And I'll go back to telling you about how important I think it is to being a member of the, of the, of, uh, the legislature. I think, uh, you know, it, As a lawyer, you know, you're interested, I mean, everything is a specialty nowadays. So, you know, say you become a personal trial injury uh, lawyer. Well, that's it. That's all you're ever going to know, you know. Your, your outlook on things is going to be limited, you know. So I think for a judge, you've got to have diversification. And one part of that diversification, I think, is, would be to be uh, a member of the legislature before coming on the bench. Or a member of some kind of a group, you know, with exposure to various things. Very important. Mm -hmm. What would you most like the legal community uh, and the general public to remember about you? <laughs> oh boy, Steve, I don't know. Well, that George was a fair guy, decent guy, and uh, judicious guy. Somebody said to me the other day, you're a peacemaker, Zeno. So maybe that's what I should say in response to this, that maybe people should think of me as a guy who tried to make peace among people. As a part of your legacy, uh, as we've already mentioned, the new Court of Appeal building in Fresno, a beautiful structure currently under construction, just a short distance where yeah. we're sitting here right now, will bear your name. What were your feelings upon learning of this tremendous, well-deserved honor? Boy, I was really honored. I was really honored. And when I got the word, I was called by a woman who was an assembly person. Sarah Reyes, she was the one that called me right off the floor of the assembly to tell me that this happened. And I didn't, I didn't have any idea of what was going on or that it was cooking, you know, that it was part of an effort by some people that I've worked with around here. So I was really, really, really shocked and I was very happy. And then I got a call from some from the press, and I just there was no words to express my gratification. It's a hell of an honor, and uh, I'm glad that I've lived up to it all of these years. And certainly, it's quite a tribute to uh, a splendid career that yeah. you've had uh, in the legislature, uh, in the courts. Yeah. And uh, as a human being. Right. And uh, I just want to thank you, Justice Inovich. Uh, this has been a very enjoyable time for me, talking with you, learning more about you. And thank you for your time and candor.
and your 23 years of uh, distinguished public service. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Maybe the next time I see you, you'll be sitting on the Supreme Court. <laughs> then I'll have someone to go up to and talk to. <laughs>